So Jacob, are you are you based in the cities as well? Yep. Yeah. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Minnesota Hockey Hockey Director Conference webinar series. My name is Jacob Mars. I chair the Hockey Director Committee for uh, for Minnesota Hockey. And my role is to help our youth associations and districts uh, put together their hockey operations committee structure, roles, coaching education program, uh, et cetera. Um, I also run our high performance youth, uh, youth 14 program and uh, get the opportunity to coach high school. Tonight, we're very excited to have some great presenters and topics for you. Uh, we have Heather Mannix from USA Hockey and also Aaron Wilbur from the Coaches Site. Uh, and I'd like to start with Aaron. The Coaches Site has been a tremendous partner of ours here at uh, Minnesota Hockey. And it's great to have you here, Aaron. For everybody that isn't quite sure what the Coaches Site is, I know you're gonna go over it, but I highly recommend that everybody on the call takes advantage of it, utilizes those resources and continues to learn. So Aaron, thanks for joining us tonight. No, thanks so much, uh, Jacob, and, and hi everybody. Um, it's it's great to be here, and I'll just say that you know we're extremely proud of the partnership that we have with Minnesota Hockey, and uh, you know I think the reason that, that I am here today is really rooted in a, an introduction to Mike Snee, the former executive director of Minnesota Hockey, several years ago, and we had met at the um, American Hockey Coaches Association annual convention in Naples, Florida, and, and just got talking one evening and, and realized that we had a lot of shared values in the sport, what our game was about, the opportunity it provided for young people. And I, I'm not sure sometimes how um, aware uh, coaches and people involved with the game are in Minnesota, just how different it is than uh, the rest of the world. And I think that there's a lot uh, in Minnesota that's extremely special. The fact that you've been able to keep it community-based uh, that kids step on the ice representing their communities and their school. And, and I can tell you that, you know, from an outsider's perspective, that that's something that's, that's really unique and, and I think, uh, um, and really special. So I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction of the coaches site and, uh, and then I'm going to pass it off to Heather. Um, I, I will know, I believe there's been some communication that has been sent out uh, this Thursday at 7 PM. Um, uh, your time, um, we are going to be streaming a conversation uh, that I have, or I'm going to be having with Dean Evanson, the head coach of the Minnesota Wild, uh, just talking about how he's preparing for training camp, um, how he's going to be spending the holiday season. And uh, we are also going to be having some questions that we've collected from players around the state uh, that we're going to put in front of them as well. So I uh, really encourage you to, to tune into that. I think it's going to be really cool. And um, I can just tell you, I think you guys got a, a great coach on your hands in Dean. So without further ado, I'm just going to share my screen here. And uh, hopefully can, everybody can see that. So this is the homepage of your website. And um, so really what the coaches site is, and I'll just reload this. Um, we, we felt when we started this that there was a real um, gap or um, bottleneck of information in terms of what professional coaches uh, were doing at the game's highest level and, and the information that sometimes would filter down to the grassroots and amateur level. So when we started it, our mission was really simple. We wanted to uh, access uh, the minds and experience and insights of the game's top leaders. And we wanted to provide them a platform that they could share that information. And, and we always knew that coaches by nature, that they're teachers, and that if we gave them an opportunity to that, you know, they would embrace the opportunity to uh, connect with coaches from around the world. And as it stands right now, we are uh, uh, we're really fortunate um, in that we have members on our site from uh, over 14 different countries. And I think what makes us kind of unique is that uh, I'm, I'm talking to you from Vancouver, Canada, um, but we don't represent Hockey Canada. We don't represent Hockey USA and we don't represent uh, Hockey Finland. We, we are a neutral voice and our job is every day to go out and find uh, the top coaches, to find new ideas, um, to talk to the top, you know, whether it's hockey directors or skills coaches, and just try and get the best information we can and present that, um, not in a, 
you know, a have to do sort of way, but just in the form of ideas so that hopefully coaches, administrators, volunteers um, can access that and they can, they can pull and steal uh, what they think is relevant and valuable to them. Um, so if we just scroll down, you can see that we have a variety of videos. There's on ice videos, there's chalk talk videos. We have a partnership with the NHL coaches association. Um, we have conference videos. So every summer, uh, we host a, a conference in either Vancouver or Toronto. Uh, it's an unbelievably uh, fun weekend. Uh, again, it, it brings together coaches from around the world, from all levels. So you'll literally have in the audience, um, you know, a Stanley Cup winning coach sitting beside a, uh, a parent that's, you know, just trying to learn a little bit of information so they can coach their eight-year-old. Uh, it's a really cool dynamic. Uh, we have a variety of interviews. Uh, we have articles. And I think in total, if we were to summarize it, uh, we've got north of 200 different videos and north of 1,000 um, articles uh, on the site. I'm just going to quickly take you through, give you a couple of examples. So we have a lot of drills. Uh, some of you may recognize the Coach Them uh, logo. So we work together with Coach Them. I know they're also a proud partner of Minnesota Hockey. So we've got a database of drills and practice plans. Uh, that you can access on the site. Um, I know that there, you, you're going to be discussing um, uh, Finnish hockey. So I thought I would share this. This is just an excerpt. This is uh, the Finnish national team coach, uh, Juko Jolinen. And, and, I, and I know that's probably not the correct pronunciation, but just talking we, about the principles. I will open up you like a playbook of Finnish national team's principles. Of course, we'll talk about details as well, but we want to start with the principles. So it's a little bit more easy for the players to adjust and uh, start playing straight away, not thinking too much. So just a quick excerpt there. Um, we have a podcast uh, that we host every week during the season. Uh, this is an episode we did last year with Bob Motzkel. Um, who, of course, is the coach of the uh, Minnesota Gophers, was also the coach of Team USA um, at the, the World Junior Championships. And I'll also note, uh, for anybody that likes podcasts, we have a really special episode uh, coming up that's going to be released on Boxing Day. Uh, it's going to feature Brent Sutter, um, who is a Canadian coach. He coached Canada to back-to-back -back gold medals. But we're also going to have Phil Housley, a, a Minnesota native, and also a gold medal, gold medal winning coach from the World Junior Championships on the same episode. And we're going to sort of break down, um, you know, their process and experience in, in winning a gold medal and how they prepared their teams. Um, so you can follow our newsletters to get uh, an update on that. Um, we also, we, we feature a lot of different content. So we kind of, in, in some ways, consider ourselves kind of like Netflix for coaches. Um, so this is an example here. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Troy Ward. He's a Minnesota native. Uh, currently lives uh, uh, on a lake in Wisconsin. So we have a series with him. It's called Troy Ward's Mailbag uh, from the pond at Deer Lake uh, because he's got a pond outside his office, which is right beside Deer Lake. Um, so this is an example here. Hi, everyone. Aaron Wilbert, founder of the Coaches Site. Uh, I'm really excited today to address with our team without changing everything uh, about our players. So that's something that we've looked at. I think every team is, is trying. Um, and I bring that one up. So in the, the initial uh, episode that Troy did, he brought on Bruce Cassidy, of course, the head coach um, and, and current Jack Adams award winner uh, with the Boston Bruins. Uh, for an interview. Uh, but generally what Troy does is coaches can submit questions um, and then he answers three to four of them each week uh, on air. Um, I mentioned that we have a partnership with the NHL Coaches Association. So this is a series that we've developed uh, with them. It's called uh, Chalk Talk. So we bring in NHL coaches and they break down uh, tactics and systems um, in a progression-based way, the same way that they would teach their players. So this uh, Particular example is with Dan Muse, uh, who was an assistant coach uh, with the Nashville Predators. Prior to that, he was with the Chicago Steel and, and recently was named the head coach of the uh, U.S. National Development uh, U18 program. I'm Dan Muse, and this is the Coach's Site Chalk Talk Series. 
Today we're going to talk about a series of drills that I've used to work on neutral zone movement. First drill that we're going to look at today is a, drill, a shooting drill that's designed to focus in on neutral zone movement. The setup of the drill is all players and coaches are going to be at the center ice circle. You'll have a coach here at the top of the circle and a coach here. You'll have the so hopefully everybody gets a bit of a sample there and just moving along quickly here. And I, and again, I want to be mindful of your time. Uh, we also do on ice videos. Uh, so just in terms of the kind of the international flavor, this is an example here with Mats Lindgren. Uh, he's a Swedish skills coach. And he's just doing a uh, passing progression. You want to be nice and low. So when the puck comes, you're going to open up this way and then a back and pass. Receive the puck, you don't want to go up with your upper body, you want to stay nice and low. It should not be a kicking motion with your foot. There you go. So, the good news is, everybody hopefully is going to have the coach's site theme song in their head for the rest of the evening, so you don't forget about this presentation. Um, and then again, I mentioned uh, Mike Snee and, and, and the relationship, and we had invited him to come up and speak at our conference, and it was uh, it was really great. He, he got to talk about what he, he valued about Minnesota hockey. Um, and, and I, you know, we've actually, you know, based on this, we did a bit of a study. And what we discovered is that per capita, the state of Minnesota um, puts more players in professional hockey than anywhere in the world, and uh, which is really remarkable. And, um, and, and really kind of dove into what some of those, those reasons were. And I think in a lot of ways, the reasons for the success of Minnesota hockey is really counterintuitive. Uh, to, to the way hockey's done in a lot of parts of the world. But this is just a brief snapshot of Mike's presentation. Signed an NHL contract at the conclusion of this past season. And I would say he's uh, very likely will play games and has a pretty good shot of having a, a, um, an NHL career. Um, so an example of the non-community aspect that we're finding uh, elsewhere outside of Minnesota. Another key distinction in Minnesota is that it's non-profit. Uh, most of our arenas are municipal, actually, actually all of our arenas are municipally owned, except for some small studio sized rinks that are uh, training facilities and so on. So it's all 240 sheets of ice are municipally owned. All of our associations are volunteer based. So again, it's, it's a great presentation. I would encourage everybody to check it out. Um, you can do so. We have a 10 day free trial. If you'd like to sign up, uh, I would encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. Um, for anybody that's interested we, uh, we currently have a Christmas promotion going on where you can buy and save $35 uh, on an annual membership. So it's $85 Canadian. Um, and, I, and I'm pretty sure everybody um, probably has $85 Canadian stashed in their couch somewhere. Uh, we think it's really good value. We also offer discounts to large organizations and associations. And again, our goal is really simple. We really want to be uh, a positive uh, part of ensuring that kids have a, a great experience uh, when they come to the rink each day, we think that that starts with good leadership, good coaching. We believe that good coaching and good leadership starts with having access to to really good information. And, and as I said, we're not um, uh, we're not uh, we don't see it through a Canadian or a Canadian lens. We don't see it through a U.S. lens. We we see it through a lens of what we think is best for the game, and and we try and go out and find the best people in our sport and give them a platform to share their their uh, their best ideas. So I'm going to pass it off to Heather. Uh, thanks, Derek. Thanks, Jacob, for having me. And, and thanks to everybody who's tuning in and just taking time uh, in December um, with everything that's going on in the world. I just think it's, it's so cool. Um, and I think that it really speaks volumes about our game and the type of people that are involved with it. So again, thanks for having me and uh, enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thanks, everyone. Aaron, thank you very much. That, that's a great resource and I would recommend um, everybody on this call to take advantage of that 10 day trial. And I think that you'll get hooked. I've had the chance to look at a bunch of the videos uh, and resources that they have on the coaches site. Um, and, the, and, the, and there is something for everybody. So Aaron, thank you very much. With that, I'm excited to introduce uh, our next presenter. <laughs> Tonight's topic is all about uh, the exchange that USA Hockey did uh, with like Finland, as well as some studies that are coming out of Sweden. Uh, and our presenter tonight is Heather Mannix with USA Hockey. Heather is a ADM regional manager for female hockey. 
uh, and has the entire state as her, or I'm sorry, the entire country as uh, her territory um, and has been a great friend to Minnesota hockey. This uh, back in April, Heather presented on another player development webinar that we completed and she talked about coaching psychology and the fun maps, which for those of you that haven't had the chance to check that out yet, it's on our YouTube page for Minnesota hockey and talks all about what makes sports fun. Uh, so with that, Heather, I appreciate you joining us tonight. Thanks, Jacob. I love being here. And you know, it got me thinking, Heather, when um, when Aaron was showing that presentation uh, from Snee, who's executive director of College Hockey Inc. and, and is a like Minnesotan, and he was talking about how our programs are strong and they're nonprofit and they're community-based. I know that the, the reason we wanted to talk about the Finnish exchange was because of the similarities between um, the Nordic states and to what we're doing here in like Minnesota. And when you look at other states outside of Minnesota who have pulled away, let's just use I'm like Michigan as an example. The ones that pulled away from community-based hockey to for-profit saw their numbers drop drastically. But when you look at what we're doing here in Minnesota and staying community-based compared to, again, using I'm like Michigan as our example, our numbers keep growing while theirs keep dropping. And so uh, appreciate you being here where we can talk about it, uh, all of all, all the differences and similarities in our programs and what our hockey directors can learn from that. So thanks, Heather. Yeah, absolutely, Jacob. And I'm uh, very excited to talk about, you know, the, the strengths of a community-based program and what that has to offer um, for, for development and, and kids in general. So there are a ton of similarities between the way that Minnesota runs their, their programs and, uh, and the way that the Nordic states uh, countries do as well. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and hopefully you can see that. So what I want to do is just kind of, it's, it's crazy to think of, you know, what a year has, uh, has done. And it was about this time last year that I, that I was just coming back from Finland. And uh, it was right after I started working with USA Hockey. And so it was really exciting to, to be able to go over there and, and learn from their program managers, which um, their program managers have the same roles, uh, very similar roles that, that we do as ADM managers. And so kind of get into why that's important and, and the impact that that can have. So first I want to talk about Finland and I took some information off of some of the slides that our Finnish friends uh, gave us, um, presented to us when they were over here. And so just a little bit of background on, uh, on FIHA. So it's uh, one of the things that I really like to highlight is that there's, they have about only about 39,000 youth players uh, same with with uh, Sweden. So from the, the Nordic countries, they have very low, like smaller numbers compared to the U.S., but they continue to produce a high number of you know, athletes that play at the highest level. And, and so when we when we think about, you know, the comparisons between countries like Finland and Sweden and their numbers and the comparison to, to Minnesota, we start to see some similarities. And so when we look at them, um, we have this little graph here. And so you look at Finland, they have, you know, just about like 37,000 youth players, uh, Sweden about 49, close to, to 50,000, and then Minnesota uh, at 57, just over 57,000. And then you look at the the number of, oops, of players that are that are playing in the NHL coming from each one of these these areas. And so I think it's a it's a timely topic to to talk about some of the similarities and some of the things that we learned, or at least I learned from from going over there, and also some of the research that's coming out of both of these countries is really really impactful on development and and the way that we structure the environments that we um, put our kids in and what is the best for their overall development. And so we'll kind of get into that as well. And so Finland was broken down into uh, to eight regions, and so if you Remember back to me saying that they have they have nine regional coaches, so regional managers. Um, we at USA Hockey have twelve for the entire country, and and so with the amount of youth players that we have in the U.S., which is about 
Uh, that number might be a little bit off. It's about 300,000 youth, uh, youth players, and we have 12 regional managers where they have nine regional managers, um, or regional coaches, and they work directly with their, their clubs, so their coaching directors within their districts. Um, and they, a lot of clubs have skilled coaches. And that's not necessarily what we would think when we think of skill coaches, we think more of like a technical tactical skill coach. Um, the, the role of the skill coach in the associations in Finland uh, is more of a coach developer. And so a lot of times the regional coaches will work with the skill coaches and, and then they actually go and work with the, the actual coaches to help them develop within their organization and within their association. And so that's something that, you know, we would love to, to, you know, ideally have something like that here in the U.S. Um, oftentimes we rely on a, a hockey director to, to help develop the coaches within their association. Um, unfortunately, and realistically, hockey directors are typically being pulled in 100 different directions. And, uh, and so coach development within the association is sometimes uh, a, tall, a tall order to ask for. And so you know, just kind of shining a light on the importance of having a role and a position within the association that is specifically focused on developing coaches within that association is hugely important in keeping at the, the forefront of development and making sure that your coaches are, are in line with the, the best developmental practices for your kids. Let's see. One of the things I do love, though, and this is this is a, a slide that I actually took from uh, from Sammy Newton's uh, presentation, the difference between teaching and learning. And so, oftentimes, we we find ourselves in in a teaching role in in the coaching role, where it's it's us up there talking, and our players are standing around and listening to us. And we need to understand and recognize that that's very different than learning and what learning looks like. And so. Learning, if you look at the picture on the right, is really, it's done by doing, it's done by playing, it's done by practicing. And so I think that's one of the, the things that I, I definitely respect about the way they approach development over there is where they're trying to keep kids in, in practice more movement and constantly moving. This is just an example. So the programs over there are really focused on, on making sure and, and understanding what learning actually looks like. Um, and what we know about learning and from the, the science and the data is that learning is really messy. Learning is, uh, it's not that five on O breakout that makes us and us adults and parents and coaches feel really good about ourselves because it looks really nice and neat. Um, it is, it's actually very chaotic and, uh, and it's, it's very messy. And sometimes that makes us as adults feel a little bit uncomfortable. And so when we look at Sweden as well um, and the way they approach their, their player development, one of the things they, they just put out, um, they, they call it the, the home model program. So um, it's really kind of promoting that community based where kids stay close to home. Um, they, they grow up within their organization, their associations where they have opportunities where they don't have to travel hours to, um, to just to, to be able to have good developmental opportunities. And so one of the things that they focus on it's making sure that the player stays in the center of, of all of the decisions that are being made from a developmental standpoint. And so they acknowledge that, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of different players that, that play into the development of these players. Um, and so we have our parents, we have our coaches, we have the club and the association atmosphere and the environment that that club creates, along with, you know, the, the role models and the accessibility to those role models. Um, within the actual development, uh, you know, framework, if you will, again, the player is at the, at the center of it, but we have all of these different skills that they, they really focus on. And so it's not just the, the technical, you know, skills, the technique, um, we have those hockey skills, we have those physical skills, but they also look at the, the psychosocial aspect of, of development and, and developing that hockey sense and understanding that, again, referees play a role in that development. Um, anytime 
any adult that is within the arena of the players uh, impacts the environment and impacts the experience for the for the players. And so if everybody's on board from an adult standpoint, and we all have the idea of keeping the players and their development at the forefront of every decision that we make and all of our actions within, you know, the, the rink itself, um, that's when we know that we're doing the best for the player. We're doing the best thing for the player. And we kind of take away those um, adult uh, uh, notions of success and, and, um, and you know, less focused on, on the outcomes of games and more focused on what is best for the actual development of the players. So they, Sweden and Finland, you know, because of the, the numbers that they have in their country, they have to, retention is key. If they can't keep kids engaged in the sport, then the sport will die. Um, you know, if you think about the, the numbers that they have, if they, they both fall between the, the amount of youth players uh, a little bit more than Michigan, a little bit less than than Minnesota. And so and that's in their entire country. And so if you start to lose uh, players and, and athletes at at a higher rate, then the, you know, they're at risk of the sport just dying in their in their country. And so it's really critical that they focus on creating the best experience for the kids. Jacob, do you have something? This infographic or this information here is is, is tremendous. And I know that there would be others on the call that would love to have that. And maybe you're gonna to touch on this, but how do you get, or how does Finland get the parent buy-in from that young age into what they're doing? Yeah, um, I think that there's part of it that's cultural um, where, you know, they have, they have access. So from, you know, their, their school, uh, their gym hours, they can, they can, you know, be in the rink um, for gym class. Uh, so I think that there's, there's a, a, a cultural aspect. They fight the same things that we fight though. Um, I think that the, the earlier the selection process starts to happen, and that's one of the things that I know Sweden is battling and, I'm, and I think Finland is as, as well, is uh, the earlier that they start to select for talent, I think the, um, the more, uh, say outlandish or it's just the, the unrealistic expectations of parents. And so it's, it's recognizing what's best for their, their development and then educating the parents as well. And so I think that um, anytime that, that the selection process starts to come into it, that's when you start to see uh, parents acting a little bit outlandish and, and uh, not keeping the development in the forefront of, of, uh, of their minds and their decisions. <laughs> So keep on going here. Um, one of the things with Sweden, we have, they have several principles that they keep when, when, it, when it comes to setting the environment. Again, that, that player, that person-centered approach, that player-centered approach, um, and giving, giving everyone the chance to develop. So they understand that A, development is not linear, right? It's not this linear path that it just happens, you know, one step after another. Um, there's ups and downs. There's you know, the, the pathway for the development is a very messy pathway and, and having those realistic expectations um, of what development looks like is very helpful to, to keep that in mind. And they try to wait to do selections as long as possible. And so I'm not entirely sure with Finland. I do know because I've worked with, with the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation with, with some research. Um, and so I do know that at least in, in Sweden, they, uh, they wait to select. So tryouts, um, don't really happen. They there really isn't a selection process until they start to get to about U14, U15. And so when you think about the way that that system is structured and the way we run things here, it's it's very different. Um, and so it's it's really about making sure that every kid that wants to play has an opportunity to play. Um, and I know that's that's the truth. Or that's that's to be true in both of those countries. And so it's um, making sure that kids at the younger ages, if they, if they want to play, they have, they have a place to play and they have a place to develop. And then the appropriate settings. Um, so making sure that, you know, they, I'll get to the, the study that they, they, they started to work on and then both study or both countries collaborated on um, was just understanding what appropriate settings look like and understanding the data. So we, we know that the, the game is played in a series of small areas, right? All over the ice. 
Um, and so what they did is they actually started to collect data to look at the, the impact of um, manipulating the number of players and the size of the, the area that the kids are playing on and what that did to specific actions. And so they, there's some really interesting, fascinating data that is coming out of um, both of these countries that is actually um, uh, informing the way that they are structuring their game formats now. And so I know that Sweden has uh, piloted this this past year. They piloted different in seven different districts, um, uh, different game formats. And I believe last time I, I checked with them, the the plan uh, pre COVID was to roll out in in all of their districts this new game format um, based on science, based on data, and based on what's best for for their players' development within these appropriate settings at the different age groups. Um, they focus on fundamental movement skills, so they're huge proponents of multi-sport participation and of physical literacy. And so they understand that it's the, you know, they're, you're focusing on, on creating the, the human first, the athlete second, the, the hockey player last. Um, so making sure that the kids are, are well-versed and, um, and very proficient in as many movement skills as possible, they know that that's going to make them better hockey players in the end. And so there's a big off-ice component in, in making sure that the kids have all of the movement skills to be the most successful within their, their hockey programs um, when it comes to, to developing them. And so I wanted to touch just briefly on the, uh, the, the game format study that, that came out of both Finland and Sweden collaborated on the study. And so with, with Sweden, this is, they again, kept the player at the forefront of their decision making when it comes to how they structure games. And so with this study, they looked at rules and regulations, the size and surface um, of, of the playing surface. What does that look like for coach development and coach education? So um, Jacob mentioned the, the research uh, on the fun map study. So they are, they, they like us at USA Hockey are really driven by uh, science and evidence-based practices for development and how do we start to integrate that into our coaching curriculums. And so we've changed our coaching curriculum this year and it is um, exponentially better when it comes to uh, integrating science and, and data into developmental practices and, and how to become the best coaches. They're doing the same thing. And so that's where I, I along with uh, Dr. Amanda Visick, who, who uh, developed the fun maps, um, worked with the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation to integrate that into their, their coaching education programs. Um, they, they looked at different aspects for, for goalie development as well. And then with the, the change in, in game format, they had to obviously take into consideration uh, facilities and uh, facility management situations where how do, you, how do you make sure that we can create these environments in, in each of the, the facilities. So um, what's interesting is that there's, there's a ton of science, there's a ton of research on game size uh, playing surfaces in all sorts of different sports. Um, and a lot of different sports have already adapted and adopted these, these recommendations based off of the science and the data that's come out of these studies. And so um, if you look at soccer, soccer in Sweden, soccer in the US, uh, soccer in Finland, that's one of the one of the sports that have already adopted the, the different playing size formats. And so we here um, have the, the 8U cross ice um, was, was one adaptation that we made, um, but you'll see with the study that came out of both Finland and Sweden, the, the impact of changing the game surfaces and the size that the, the size and the number of players and, and the impact that that has on player development. Um, so it's it's very interesting and it's hockey is one of those and it's something that you know they, they saw in, in their uh, their countries as well. Hockey is one of those it's a it's a conservative you know doesn't want to, it's really hard to change the the way you know things have always gone. And, um, and so I think that the, the more open that we can be, and again, when it comes to understanding and keeping the player at the center of, of the, the environment and how do we create the best environment for the kids, not only for their development, but also for their enjoyment of the game. Um, I think that if we, can, if we can keep an open mind with those things, then, then uh, you know, having some changes is not the, the worst thing in the world. It's actually pretty pretty great for their development. And so 
I always kind of joke, it's, you know, I mean, you look at the numbers that, that they produce out of, uh, out of these small countries with, with, uh, with the small number of, of athletes and hockey players that they have playing, um, they're doing something right when it comes to development. And so I think that we should at least just take, take notice and, uh, and, you know, keep an open mind. So um, there is a lot of, there's also a lot of science and research within the, you know, the ice hockey world as well. And so their philosophy in both countries is they want to create the problem solver. And so, you know, this is where, you know, having those, those quick decision makers, um, being able to be creative and quick thinking. Um, it's interesting because on the fun maps, the, one of the things that we did when we, we translated the fun maps uh, research from English to Swedish uh, and then back to English to make sure every, nothing was lost in translation. And we took it out to a bunch of different kids in Sweden and asked them, you know, out of all of the 81 things that make playing sports fun that were identified for, uh, for American players, you know, do these things make sense to you? Uh, you know, just to check if there were, you know, some things that just culturally didn't make sense. And, and one of the things that I thought was, was the, the most interesting, um, I've, there was a lot of things that were interesting, but one that really kind of struck me was, there's a determinant says that, that the American kids identified the, the freedom to play creatively and the importance that that was in, in creating a fun experience. And for kids in Sweden, they didn't understand what that meant, um, the freedom to play creatively. Because here we have to, we, we give kids the freedom to play creatively, whereas there they are expected to play creatively. They are given the environment where they, um, they have the opportunity and they're encouraged to be creative and they're encouraged to push themselves so that they fail. Um, it's all about creating an environment that allows kids to, um, to feel safe, psychologically safe, physically safe, to push their limits. And when kids feel like they can, they can push themselves and fail in front of coaches, in front of their, their peers and their players, um, and their teammates, um, they will push themselves, they will push the limits, they will try to be creative, but we have to create that environment that allows them to, to feel that way. And that's something that is hugely important in both of these countries, um, is the, you know, passing over the, on, the onus of development uh, to the kids, asking them what they think is, uh, what, what do you think that you can work on? Uh, what do you think is your strengths? What do you think are your weaknesses? You know, how do you want to address them? So they're given those opportunities to, to look at their own development and take ownership of their own development, especially, you know, starting around the age of, you know, 14, 15 years old, they're almost expected to do that. And so, whereas here we have more of a top-down approach when it comes to coaching and development, where we usually tell kids, you know, what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and where to do it, um, they over there ask kids, you know, what do you think are your strengths? What do you think are your weaknesses? What do you want to work on? How can we, you know, how can we help that development? And so that's one of the things that I thought was, um, was, was really cool about the way they approach development there. And so what they did in this study was they looked at um, different playing surfaces. So different playing surfaces and then uh, number of players. And so they looked at one fourth of the ice or one sixth of the ice, one fourth of the ice, uh, one third and um, half ice and full ice, I believe. And they looked at uh, 2v2, 3v3, 4v4 and 5v5. And each one of these playing surfaces from ages from U8 to U14. And they collected all kinds of different data from each one of these, these uh, scenarios and situations. And so these are just some, some pictures of, of what that looked like. Um, they, they did full ice again with, uh, with 3v3, 4v4 and 5v5. And then they measured a ton of different hockey actions. Jacob, do you have a question? Or the only thing that I wanted to comment on and is that for those that haven't seen it, USA Hockey put out a great video a few years ago where they um, took, I think it was Little Caesars AAA team, and mm -hmm. um, they went and they put all the tracking uh, tracking devices on them. 
and they played full ice, half ice, cross ice, and they analyzed um, what the puck touches were, et cetera. And it, it sounds like kind of similar, but I would just recommend to anybody on the webinar to check out that video that USA Hockey put out on that as well. Yeah, it's a great point. And, and I believe, um, if I remember correctly, I believe that that was with, uh, with 8U Kids. Um, and so this was a very similar approach. Uh, they just did it with from 8U to, to U14, or yeah, UA to U14. And so they looked at all of these different hockey actions, right? So goals, assists, shot attempts, shots on net, block shots, missed shots, poke checks. Um, and they had trackers on the kids. Uh, so they were able to, uh, you'll see in a second here, create heat maps where you could see where the most activity was happening and where it was happening on the ice. Uh, they also they also videotaped it from three different angles. So the video from behind each one of the goalies and then uh, one from up above. So they could they could actually go back and look at. So it wasn't just data that they they produced. Um, that was one of the things that they they really wanted to stress was we can see, you know, okay, in this scenario, there are way more puck touches or there's way more body contact, but what does the game actually look like? Does, what does the flow of the game look like? So they actually watched each one of these games and decided, you know, and, and, and analyzed them in, in a way that said, okay, you know, this is the data, but what is that, what does the game actually look like? And, you know, how is it, how does it translate over to, you know, to development and, and learning the different concepts that we want our kids to learn at these different age groups. And so uh, this is just an example of the, the heat maps that they produced. And so you can see in the, the yellow, orange, and red areas that that's where the majority of the, um, the activity happened. In the, the lighter green areas, that was where less, less activity happened. And so you can kind of see um, just the, the path of the players on the ice. And so this is a this is just a breakdown of the the different actions. So this is like I think the total actions uh, that happened in the different age or in the different uh, playing surfaces and different numbers of players within each one of those uh, surfaces at each one of the age groups. And so what you see is that for eight U one sixth of the ice and one quarter of the ice produced the best numbers in terms of total hockey actions, whereas um, and that's it with 3v3 and then 5v5 one sixth of the ice and full ice at 4v4 um, was was the the least amount of hockey actions and so when we're thinking about what is the best for our kids development we want to take these things into consideration and so what you'll notice is that in each one of the age groups um, full ice continued to produce the the lowest number of, of hockey actions and this is where it kind of gets really cool and interesting in my mind. Um, some of the observations that they found was that for the, the 5v5 um, scenarios, the lowest number of shots were counted in every single age group. Okay, And then if you divided the, the shots per player in each one of the different sizes that they, uh, that they measured, it continued to produce the lowest number of shots. And so... Um, one of the things that, that we hear often in the U.S. is that, you know, uh, 8U cross ice, my kid doesn't have enough room to, to skate, to play. Uh, they're the fastest kid. They're the best kid out there. They need to, they need to go. They need to play um, full ice. And so when it comes to development and understanding, what they found was that even the dominant player, so the player that was the best player out there, they, they had the highest number of actions, but they did and they continued to have the highest number of actions in every single game format. Meaning that in every single game format, it's, they still were the best player, right? But the important thing to remember is that, so the, the stronger skaters, when they, were, when they were forced to play in smaller areas, then it challenged them to actually develop and get better at these specific tactics and, and hockey actions. Um, so, you know, having becoming becoming more comfortable with the, the puck under six. So pass attempts, shot attempts, uh, you know, body contact, all of those things happened in a higher frequency at the at the smaller, um, the smaller age or the smaller rink sizes. Um, but on the full ice, 
they were able to rely on their skating skills and they didn't have to use and develop these, these hockey actions. So they didn't, there wasn't as much body contact. There wasn't as many pass attempts. There wasn't as many shot attempts. So all of these things that when it comes to development, we want to get, we want to get kids in a situation and environment where they get the highest number of repetitions of all of these different actions. So they can't just skate away because what happens is when you have a really fast skater at eight years old and they can just skate away from everybody. Well, once everybody starts to get a little bit faster and they develop uh, along, along with the fast eight-year-old, um, they don't have, they don't, they're not the fastest skater anymore. And so we want them, we want the fastest eight-year-old to develop those, those tactical skills, right? We want them to develop the, the technique that they don't have to develop when they can rely on their skating uh, skills and their, their skating technique, and they can, they can skate away from everybody when, when they're younger, but they're losing those development opportunities when they're not put in situations where they're challenged to get better. On the same note is um, in the, the 3v3 games, so players continue to improve the number of actions regardless of their skill level. And this one I thought was really cool was when, as soon as they placed, as soon as you went above 3v3, so if, as soon as you added 4v4, the players that were the, the, uh, the lowest on the development scale, right? So the, the weakest players on the ice, they were able to kind of hide on the periphery. They, they weren't as engaged in the, the play. They weren't as engaged in the, uh, in the action. They were able to just kind of hide off onto the side. But if they put, were put in a 3v3 action, uh, in 3v3 game, in every single one of the, the game formats, all of the players got higher numbers of, of those hockey actions that they measured. So even the best players that are the dominant ones are still, they're still improving. They're still being challenged to develop. But at the same time, the weakest players have the same opportunity or a better opportunity to develop when it's a 3v3 situation. As soon as you add that fourth person, now all of a sudden they can they can hide and, and they don't get the, the same number of touches. This, the, the hockey actions significantly drop off the map as soon as we go to 4v4. And so when you think about what's best for development at the youngest ages, that 3v3 game involved the, all of the players uh, the most and it had the greatest flow of activity. So again, if you think back to they watched the, what does the flow of the game look like? We're not looking at just the hockey actions, just the hard data. What does the flow actually look like? The 3v3 situation um, in game format produced the best uh, development opportunities for all of the kids on the ice, not just the best, not just the weakest, but all of the kids continue to develop. Um, interesting enough, the uh, U14 was the only age group that was capable of handling the, the full ice format in a successful manner. Um, let's see, with smaller distances between the nets, oh yeah, players, players had to, so in the smaller areas, players transition from offense to defense and defense to offense more frequently. And so when we think about, again, how do we create the best decision makers, the best problem solvers, the ones that can recognize, all right, I'm on defense, but I'm, you know, it looks like my team's about to intercept that pass. I'm going to jump real quick. So it's those kids that can recognize those situations. Those are the kids that are the the, the ones that the create that have the best hockey sense. And so when we think about, you know, what's the most important to, to develop kids, get them to play and be successful at the next level, at the highest levels, it's that hockey sense, it's that decision making. That is the, that's the thing that's the hardest to teach at the older ages, right? So having a really smart player, you can teach them oftentimes, you know, better technique. You can teach them, uh, you know, how to be a better skater, how to, you know, have a harder shot, but it's really, really hard at the older ages to teach hockey sense. And so when we think about what's best for our development, for our kids at the youngest ages, all the way up until they, you know, until they, they hit that puberty stage, we want to continue to put them in situations that are going to create those problem solvers. The kids that are going to have to make decisions, the ones that are going to have to read, are, are we on offense, are we on defense, are we about to, if we're on defense, we're about to jump on offense, or, oh, we're on offense, but there's about to be a bad pass, I need to fall back. Creating those decision makers is the best thing that we can do for our athletes. And they're on board with that. Um, 
in the smaller in the smaller areas, uh, the, the the skating tends to be more technical, right? So the the stop starts transitions, um, the uh, avoiding body contact, the evasion, deception, all of those those skating techniques and the the more technical skating techniques when it comes to you know being able to maneuver and move around in those small spaces happens and, and is developed better in those in those smaller areas is what they found. And then this is the big thing. This is the the uh, the sort of the impact that this study had is that Sweden has changed their the way that games are played now in their country. And so at the the U9 level, um, all games are being played on one sixth of the ice, and it's one sixth of the Olympic ice, so it's a little bit larger than one sixth of the ice on, on most uh, NHL size sheets here in the U.S. Um, but still smaller, they, they've decided that this is the best thing for their players' development. So it's 3v3 for one-sixth of the ice. U10, it's 3v3 on one quarter of the ice, cross ice. Uh, U12, it's one third of the ice, cross ice. Again, 3v3. And then U14 is the, U13, U14 is the first time that they are allowed to play full ice games. Um, and even at the U14, U13, U14 uh, age, they have to come back and play. I think it's at least two, uh, two jamborees or two games um, per year at the 3v3, one third of the ice. And so when we look at the way that Sweden and, and Finland um, approach development, and again, when we start to see the parallels between uh, the way that their associations are run and the way that Minnesota hockey is, is run in that community-based structure, um, and you guys are working with very similar numbers, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is, is what is the best thing for our players in their development? And that's, that's what, you know, the, that study is starting to, to show. And Sweden has already made, you know, um, significant changes to their, their game structure uh, based on, on science and, and this data. So... That's all, that's all the, the information I have for you, Jacob, if there's any questions or if you have anything. It's really interesting hearing when you're talking about the small area portion, especially on this slide, you know, what would you recommend to associations, to hockey directors, coaches, how can you implement something similar to this within your current programming? So one of the things that um, that I, I found was interesting when I was reading through that study was we know that small areas in practice are um, are mo more beneficial for for development, but coaches often are are coaching for the next game, right? And if we if they, if if they're the games are being played on full ice, then coaches often think that they need to practice in full ice. And so that's one of the reasons that that kind of drove this study was if we create if we know that that you know smaller areas are better for development then maybe we need to create games that are smaller areas and maybe that will translate over to you know how coaches start to to practice. And so I think the first step is understanding if nothing else in practice, the, the importance and the, the utilization of small areas and, uh, and how that can impact your player's development, um, I think would be you know, a great first step if that's not already happening. Um, understanding that, you know, I know a lot of times, you know, people will say in smaller areas, my kids, you know, how do you practice skating in smaller areas? Um, Finland did one, Finland did a couple of different uh, uh, playing surfaces where they did one, I think one eighth um, north to south. Uh, they did one half of the ice north to south where, where they did, Sweden did more east to west. They did uh, half ice north south. They did it uh, half ice north south. They, they called it short where it was from the red line down. And then they did half ice north south long where they, they cut it down the middle. And so when you think about, you know, how do I, you know, if we know that in smaller areas, the, the technical uh, aspect of skating is better done, better taught in those smaller areas, you can still teach, you know, the, you know, long stride, but still have it in a smaller, um, in a smaller area, but you're cutting the ice down, you know, down the middle. I think you have to get the associations on board with 
what's what's best for for development and then start to create you know scenarios i would start with jamborees right so 3v3 jamborees where you you're starting to play in different playing uh, surfaces and i mean now that we have data and we have science even even though it's from sweden and, and finland like kids are kids this is you know this is these are numbers these are facts so we know what's what's best for them it's just uh, getting getting people on board with putting the player at the center of their own development 100 percent. if anybody on the webinar has questions you can put your question in the q a down below and uh, i can facilitate that and heather what you were talking about early on about how finland has these what essentially are their version of adm managers mm -hmm. and what how do they work with their local associations and what's something that our associations can take back from how Finland is doing that education? Yeah, um, I think it's it's similar to the, the way that they approach their coaching education is, is much different in both of the countries than ours. Um, it's much more extensive when you when you get into the higher level coaching. Um, the the other than that, it's they. I think, to my understanding, is that they work very similar to the the way that we work, where, you know, they they just have a more um, hands on approach because they have the ability to to interact with those associations uh, within their region more frequently. Where, you know, thankfully, I'm so thankful to have an awesome counterpart, Kristen Wright, um, as the as the other ADM, you know, female or manager of female hockey, but it's two of us for the entire country. So we don't have the ability to have the same uh, uh, hands-on approach as, as they do, but it's working with associations, working with their hockey directors, working with their, their skills coaches um, to make sure that you know, they, they go out with their skill coaches on the ice um, and their actual coaches on the ice and, or they'll sit in the sands and watch their, their, the coaches that run their practices. And then they sit down with them and, and ask them, you know, like, what do you think went well? What can you do better? Um, and it's all about how do we help develop coaches to understand, uh, you know, what's best for their players development. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's very similar to what, what we do. Um, it's just, they have, you know, more people per capita to be able to have that, that uh, higher touch point, so. For sure. And for those uh, who weren't able to join us previous, previous to this, starting uh, at eight o'clock tonight, we had a webinar on hockey director roles, responsibilities, association hockey operations committee. And one of the things that we talked about was coaching education at the association level and having a skills coach. Um, and it seems that a lot of our um, associations are starting to, are starting to get that way and they're starting to implement these programs. Um, I know when you look at, we have associations around our state that are doing some very unique things when it comes uh, to player development. And I see that we have Mark Dragic listening in from East Grand Forks. East Grand Forks has implemented a tremendous might and squirt program that follows a lot of these principles. I know that New Alm has, uh, Duluth has. And so for associations looking at nearby examples of what can be done, I would recommend looking to those associations. Um, we did get a question come in through the Q&A, Heather. Uh, this is from Chris, uh, from Chris Garcia. How does the development of players at the 16 and 18 levels in Finland and Sweden compared to the USA Hockey ADM program? And does this responsibility fall more on the clubs? That's, a, that's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, if you if you want to get into the, the older age groups, uh, I, Bob Mancini is um, one of our ADM managers who's very well versed in, uh, in the way that uh, the, the older kids are, are developed. Um, we we have meetings with uh, with Frölunda, one of the one of the clubs in in Sweden, one of the more successful clubs in Sweden, and that's what we we continue to to talk about. It's um, a lot of times they have professional teams that have their uh, their junior programs underneath them, so the academies, if you will, and so it's usually the development once you get to the U14. Um, that's when they start to, to select for those, those different academies and, and the hockey schools. 
Um, and then the development is usually within those, those clubs and associations. It's handled within those. And I think that each one of them, you know, kind of approaches it a little bit differently. Um, and so it's, it's been really fun to sort of learn about how the differences between the different associations. So, but I would, I would definitely uh, reach out to Bob Mancini if you have any, if you have any uh, questions when it comes to, to the higher level uh, development. In, in Sweden specifically, so. And I know that um, again, earlier in April, we held some webinars on age specific that I would recommend uh, that people take a look at on either our YouTube or the Facebook page. Um, and also utilizing the resources uh, we have through the high performance programs. I know that uh, uh, the development directors in high performance at the 16, 17 levels will be more than happy to talk about that with any of you as well, uh, along with your local district hockey director and, uh, and your district coach and chief. And, and just to kind of, to elaborate a little bit more on that, and this is something that I, I know that Minnesota does much, or at least has access to uh, ice time way more than many other places in the US. Uh, that's one of the biggest differences though with, with Sweden and Finland, especially at the older ages within those associations and in those clubs. The, uh, the number of, you know, touches, uh, ice touches that they get um, at, you know, the, the 16, 18, 20, uh, 20 level where, I mean, they're, they're getting six, seven ice touches, you know, a week and each ice touch, <laughs> sorry, dogs, um, each, ice, each, each ice touch uh, has an off ice component as well. So the, you know, that's, I think, one of the, the biggest differences that I see between uh, you know, between the U14, U16, U18 level over there and, and over here. It's just the number of ice touches uh, and the, the on, and ice, on ice and off ice development. When you and I were in Denver for the coach uh, developer training last year, I remember being able to talk to hockey directors and coach developers from all over the country. And having conversations with those from Chicago, Los Angeles, Houston. Uh, um, uh, there, there was a gentleman uh, from Utah and looking at their, the ice that they have and around the country, there are teams that are only getting on the ice two or three times a week. And you have to drive two plus hours for that right. practice because of ice availability. And I think that you're spot on that here in Minnesota, we have a ton of ice. And for our teams, our players, our parents to utilize it effectively, it doesn't all have to be drills, drills, drills. Allow kids to go out there and just screw around and be kids and play shinny. And I know um, that you've told me in the past that in Finland and Sweden, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of go to the pond or the lake. You see gorgeous pictures of the mountains surrounding hockey players out there, but just taking advantage of being a kid um, and having fun. Yeah. And when it comes to development, if you think about, you know, the, the difference between the kids nowadays uh, and, you know, even when we grew up, it's the, the opportunity to, to just play and that free play. Um, you know, again, Minnesota has a, a, a different environment, which is, I think, one of the reasons why you continue to be a powerhouse um, is you have the ability to get out on the pond and you have the ability to, to be creative and just go out and play, where in a lot of other areas of the country, we don't have the, the ice time and everything is just super structured and overstructured for these kids um, that we're, we're basically, you know, coaching the creativity out of kids by the time they're 12 years old. And that's the last thing that we ever want to do as coaches, especially if we want to continue to be, you know, leaders of the world in, in our um, in our hockey development. So, oh, absolutely. And I was thinking about even when in Minnesota here we're on a pause right now for hockey, and the governor's going to make an announcement tomorrow. Uh, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We, you know, our fingers are crossed that we're going to be allowed back on the ice here after uh, after this week. But I was even thinking about how do our teams come back from this? And it dawned on me that we need to put our players into game-like situations as quick as possible. And also in a way that's going to get um, their endurance up. And I think by utilizing what you were talking about and the small area games, et cetera, um, could be the best way to do that is just put them into those 
into those game-like situations and environments and force them to work their butts off so they can get back into game shape here as soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, conditioning, and a lot of times, you know, we look at conditioning, we think we have to, you know, bag skate our kids or do herbies, you know, for uh, for the last 20 minutes of a, of a practice in order to condition them. But again, when we think about how do we prepare our kids for the game, I mean, it is it is those battles are, uh, are some of the, the hardest, you know, cardiovascular um, just challenges for, for our kids. And those are, are best set up in those smaller areas. So um, yeah, you don't have to, don't, don't have to bag state kids anymore for, for conditioning, you know, a little bit better. <laughs> so true. Well, Heather, thank you very much for joining us for, uh, for the, for the webinar and all the information that you provided tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. And for those interested, this webinar was streamed live on the Minnesota hockey YouTube channel, and it can be shared, um, however you would like through that. Um, the Hockey Director Conference Series is sponsored by Coach Them, the Coaches site, uh, Hockey Rink Systems, Tree Orthopedics, and the Hockey Intelligent and Sports Engine. So thank you all for joining us. Heather, have a great evening uh, and 